is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are previewing the 2020 Major League Baseball season, which starts tomorrow with Dan Zimborski of Fangrass breaking down his Zips projections for this year, the impact of a 60-game season, and a couple of bets he likes for this year. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, we were off last week for the first time since the show started. Got a week to recharge yeah. a bit how you feeling today with sports finally back tomorrow i guess feeling, other sports finally back i'm feeling pretty good we we never missed a show through the pandemic like we just did one, one with nfl draft we did not miss a single show we every week we had a show i think i'm 90 percent sure wow all right i know it's weird we even, we even did one the week i had covid i, I guess i guess we did it you had like, it before. thursday i think yeah. And Which meant it was the day after we'd it. recorded, and then I think you had recovered. Because I was getting, I yeah. was texting you about it, and I think I was texting with you about the all yeah. the weekend about it. And we were, you were, like, good to go by that next week somehow, which I mean, is still interesting. But, like, hey, we didn't miss a show. Despite you getting <laughs> we COVID, we show. still made it. <laughs> I think we should, uh, we should uh, have a pin for the next show that says, you know, didn't miss a show through the pandemic, but right. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, uh, we owe big congratulations to you, Jim, for uh, tying the yeah. knot last week. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was definitely different than the initial plans because it's generally hard to have a, a wedding uh, with social distancing in place. But we went, we did it outside. We did it with just ten people. We did it on uh, the shores of Lake Michigan, so that was fun. Um, had my stepdad be the officiant so we could have one less person we had to, to have tag along with us. So it, it worked out really well. I was I was very happy with it. I mean, I, you'd hope you'd be happy with the wedding. But I think that it was nice to have the wedding but also feel pretty safe in my mind that we weren't putting people in danger. And we'll yeah. do the actual reception, the full reception with everyone dancing and stuff like that next year instead. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Absolutely. But it was uh, it was definitely fun. And how was your week off? That was good. Sat by lake, did nothing. That's the that's the goal, man. That is always the goal, regardless of whether or not you're off or off. That that is always the goal. Later today, we're gonna talk with Dan Zimborski. You can find him on Twitter at d Zimborski, spelling on the last name is S Z Y M B O R S K I. He's a senior writer for Fangrass and the creator of the Zips projection system. We're gonna talk with Dan about this year's MLB season, the impact of a 60 game schedule, what that does to the variance. Uh, what Zips does for variants normally during a full season. And we're discussing teams that Dan thinks, uh, some teams and players Dan thinks can take advantage of the condensed season. Dan was actually like good enough to talk to me on my show when I had like no listeners on a, uh, a no listener radio show back in Albert Lee, Minnesota, like back in the day. Uh, so not surprised he was nice of us. It's nice enough to come on the show, but uh, definitely appreciative of Dan lending his time, especially when things are so busy right now. Uh, Ed, are you going to be, a, a, are you still a Tigers fan or do you have any rooting interest for baseball this year? Or where, where are you leaning there? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm usually just a fan of the sport, but yeah, I, you know, it's, there, there's no pressure being a Tigers or a Lions fan. See, that's the nuts. issue is like, I'm a twins no. fan and it's, it's a shortened season. And of the teams that lose with it being a, a smaller, a smaller sample twins are on that list. That's not that fun. Um, right. I was in Illinois this this past week for the wedding, and they have some mobile sports betting, so I did place a wager on the Chicago White Sox to kind of hedge my emotional bets. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> that was beneficial. But it definitely does not help teams like the Twins uh, when things are like this. We're talking with, Zan with Dan about that in just a little bit. But first, for years, NumberFire's premium subscription service has provided our users with expert analysis, survivor pool tools, and most importantly, the Fantasy Football Draft Kit, all for up to $49.99 per month. Now, as a way of saying thank you to our community for your support, NumberFire is rolling out a new premium package for just $9.99 a month that will provide you with all the sports betting and daily fantasy tools you need year-round. And the best part is the expert analysis. Those survivor tools and, yes, even the draft kit are now free. Head to NumberFire.com to check out the new and improved site and take advantage of the premium package today. 
Let's pause now to bring in Dan Zimborski once again. Find all of his work over at Fangraphs.com and check out his Zips projections right there. We're going to talk with Dan about the upcoming MLB season in which teams may be able to take advantage of the shortened schedule. Covering the present. Let's welcome Dan Zimborski into Covering the Spread. Dan, I appreciate it. I know that you're probably swamped with baseball <laughs> starting up tomorrow. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Uh, how are you guys? I'm just happy that... That I am swamped with baseball instead of swamped with no baseball, as has been the case for the last, you know, four months now. Yeah, it's been wild. And it's it feels kind of surreal, honestly, that it's actually here because I feel like I've been expecting some sort of weird snag. And by the weird snag, I mean a literal pandemic to like trip things up by the time we got to this point. But it hasn't happened yet. Uh, but I, I got to ask, like, what did you do to fill the time? I know you're kind of video game guy. Is that where you mostly went to fill the void for the past couple of months? Or what were you doing, I guess, in that in the interim? Well, there was still a lot of baseball writing to do. It was just True. a little harder to think up ideas. I, I'm always happy that I'm not a beat guy because they had it the roughest <laughs> because mm. they, you know, they, they're, they're reporting on the day in, day out. So it wasn't quite as, as bad for me as, as for, for some other people. But uh, I mean, I, I'd be I was still employed covering a sport that didn't really exist. Uh, so <laughs> so it makes me feel like I'm employed again, which is always a good feeling. Yes, I can concur on that one. Employment is generally a plus. Um, but it, for sure, it, it, it was definitely strange to try to, to fill that void. Do you feel like an extra level of excitement this year, knowing that we've been waiting for all this time and dragging out the anticipation for so long? I mean, I'm pretty excited. There's, you know, because of the pandemic going around, there's always kind of that feeling in the back of my sure. head. Uh, but I'm more confident than most uh, because some people seem to have kind of the baseline that, to be a successful season, Major League Major League Baseball has to have nobody uh, contracting COVID-19. But I yeah, think that's kind right. of an unreasonable baseline. I mean, the baseline for a cancer treatment isn't that it cures everybody. Uh, it's just, can baseball keep players safer than they would be otherwise? Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that if they can, I mean, it was a rough start when that, you know, the first weekend where nobody, where like, four or five teams or three or four teams had nobody show up to test the players. That was a rocky start and a little worrisome. Uh, but if, you know, they six positive tests last weekend, if they can keep that up, then we can have a season and it'll be cool because there's not much happening except for COVID-19. So right. it'll be cool to have something happening. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point, Dan. And, and I think, I think it was Adam Silver that, you know, acknowledged that there's going to be positive cases, but he didn't necessarily have like a number in his head uh, I don't know what the baseball commissioner is doing, but like, yeah, you can't expect zero, right? There, there's going to be some cases. You hopefully have protocols to deal with it, and then we can have a season and get all the way to the World Series. Yeah, I mean, the players are. I mean, they're they're you know, young males between 20 and 40. They're they're not going to sit cloistered in their in their houses for three months without baseball and be in their panic rooms with the <laughs> with the bubbles. I mean. I, I made a lot of dumb decisions when I was in my 20s and 30s. I'm 42, and I still make a lot of dumb decisions. So I, I, I think there's a chance that, that this can work out pretty well, uh, yeah. hopefully, crossing fingers. And I mean, we've even seen positive tests in NASCAR and PGA in sports where you can socially distance. They proceeded on too. So uh, in smaller player pools too, which is where one guy tests positive is a bigger impact. So I think if they can get through, baseball can too. So let's talk some baseball, Dan. But the the benefit of talking to you and the, something we like to do here on Covering the Spread is we like to dig into kind of the nuts and bolts behind math things because we love data here on Covering the Spread. So we've got you here. We're going to talk about the origin of Zips because – it's obviously an intricate projection system that you've been running. You created a, a while ago. When did Zips get going? Uh, how long have you been doing all this? Well, I, I, I first briefly talked about, we'll discuss the concept of what became Zips in the mid nineties. Uh, a, a friend of mine named Chris Dial. I don't know if you know him. He's vaguely around Twitter. Uh, he uh, was on the board of uh, the of Sabre for a number of years. Uh, we, we talked a lot in the 90s. Uh, we, we've been friends for a long time. And we, we, we discussed what if we could put together a basic projection system that got us most of the way there. there the internet was kind of not really as advanced as it was today. Sabre Metrics was kind of limited to a few sites. Uh, and for projections, you had baseball prospectuses work. Uh, the early one, I think it was still Vlad at this point or, or Wilton. I think Vlad came before Wilton because... You wouldn't name something Wilton before Vlad. <laughs> uh, 
Ron Chandler's work, you know, various uh, magazine previews, which weren't really necessarily scientific. And it's the kind of thing that Tom Tango later did with uh, Marcel. Kind of the idea was a basic, let's get most of the way there projections. Never actually did anything like that. Uh, we never got around to doing it. It was just something we discussed. Uh, I remember the, that about five or six years later. Uh, this was 2001, 2002. I was uh, writing for um, Baseball Primer, it was called then. And I thought about revisiting uh, the projections. And it, was, it became something a lot more complicated than, than the initial idea of a simple projection system. Uh, so I came up with Zips in over 2002, 2003 uh, was the first early development. I mean, it's constantly been in development for you know, 20 years now almost. Uh, and it was I, I made it rhyme with dips because it was kind of the first projection system that was using some of Warish McCracken's research uh, into into a, a fielder picture independence, you say, of balls. Uh, and so the Z was for Zimborski because I didn't want to be called Sips. Uh, <laughs> and I made it look like a little I and a little less initially because I liked uh, chips when I was a little kid. And so I wanted the same kind of I know it's it's a really stupid reason but i didn't expect anybody to ever actually look at this or use it for anything so so then zips was born and uh jay jaffe uh he linked it like that first day uh when he was still had his blog which was futility infielder and people liked it it it, it worked uh i it's a lot more complex now than it was uh at that point but it's it's it, it's it's been fun to develop things and you learn a lot when developing a projection system Scarily, sometimes I think the thing you most learn about is being wrong. Yeah. Because when you run projections or do anything like this, there's no illusion of your omnipotent predictions of the future. And you learn a lot more from being wrong than being right. Uh, so it, it's I've learned a lot over the years. I hope that I've helped people over the years and people like the product. And I do a lot of things with it I never really envisioned doing with it at, at the time. Yeah, Dan, that's awesome. I've been using your Zips pitcher projections uh, for a long time to account for starting pitchers when when I project games over on my site. Um, give us a little sense for like how you build those up on, on a player-by-player -player level. Well, I I think of it a lot of the way that uh, that like hurricane forecasts work. <laughs> okay. It's, 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 it's the same kind of concept, obviously, a storm. I mean, they are named storms. Uh, you're with a hurricane, you're essentially starting with where a hurricane is, and you know, based on historical data, uh, uh, they, they kind of have the idea of how hurricanes interact with you know high pressure, low pressure, uh, and you know, there's it, it's it's built off that, and you had kind of that cone of ignorance that comes off. If you ever see like one of those graphics where the uh, yeah. they show the track and it widens and like a big cone, sure. uh, and, and baseball players are like that. Your your fundamental challenge is. First, identifying where a player is. And that's harder uh, than a lot of people think because one of the things about player performance is you never actually truly know if you're right or exactly where a player is. A player who hits 300 last year, we don't really know based on even the sample size we have, you know, 500, 600 at-bats, we don't really know if they were in fact a 300 hitter that year they could have been a 300 hitter they could have been truly a you know a 290 hitter that was lucky a 310 hitter who was unlucky and you never really get to know the correct answer so it's it's it's, it's a very probability based so once i have a baseline uh then i try to get an estimate of where the player is going and i use baseball history for that uh this kind of strategy has been used before uh pakota uses it uh, the Elias Baseball Analyst, they used a system like that also in the late 80s. Uh, Zips uses large cohorts of similar players to try to construct just kind of a, you know, a blueprint for the, the, the player's next decade for the rest of their career, uh, however long that is. And that's, there's not a lot of other approaches, I think, that make a lot of sense because all we know about baseball is what's happened in baseball. We don't have a lot of experimental data in baseball. There's no simulations of players. There's not, like, you know, physics we can draw on. Uh, so that's that's the approach I take. And, I mean, I'm always refining uh, the model and, and the things I do. Uh, but I, I, I'm pretty happy with where it is. It's not perfect, and it can always be better. Uh, but I, I like new challenges. Yeah, that's awesome, Dan. And and I really love, like, kind of the historical perspective you gave of, like, in the 90s and, final, you know, doing something by, by 2003. I mean, obviously, since 2003, we have a ton of new data 
um, in baseball. How do you look at that new data and what's your process for whether you want to include that in your model? Well, I'm, I'm very careful when, when I add new things. I don't want to, to, uh, to, to, to break anything, let's just say. Uh, I mean, th there, there's a lot of techniques you can use uh, long term. I've, I've always been a fan of, you know, principal component analysis and things like that to try to, 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 to just find the variables that have predictive value. And that, that yeah. takes time. Uh, I'm not quick to, you know, just throw in StatCast data because there's a lot of great things in StatCast uh, and a lot of stuff I'm excited about. But we still don't know really yet precisely what is cool and what is actually cool and predictive, uh, <laughs> especially with some of the de defensive things. Yeah. We, we have enough, you know, on, on pitch velocity and that kind of thing that, that we do have an idea, and I'm very careful about how I integrate it. Like, I, we know that velocity is important on some level, uh, that your, the projections are enhanced by, kn by knowing how hard a pitcher throws. Uh, and I always have a, a kind of... Versions of zips that are like a few years in the future that, you know, I want to test on live data. There's only so much you can do with, with, with cross-validation. I just like to have, you know, live actual information that I don't know ahead of time. Just, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's a philosophical stretch that I need to do that. But I, I, I feel that anything I offer, I have to have some confidence in. Right. And you'd rather be over-prepared than under-prepared in, in general, which I think is a good thing, too. And like you said, you don't want to make any rash decisions when adding things in. Let's talk about this year, Dan, because it's a definitely a unique situation because I think in a 162 game season, there's going to be variance in the player level, but from the team level, you generally expect the cream to rise to the top and there's still variance there. But how different is the variance projection on the team level basis when we go from 162 games down to 60 games for this year? Well, well the variance... It, 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 it's it's huge. Yeah. Uh, the the roster strengths, even the roster strengths themselves, are more variable because we have things like injuries because they don't really scale the same way the rest of the season does. Uh, one way Zips projects teams is it it doesn't actually know how strong a team is. If it believes that a team is on average a 500 team, Zips knows that it doesn't know that for a fact. Uh, you see sometimes people project that way, you know, use the binomial distribution and say, treat it like coin flips. But they're like coin flips where you don't know how the coin is weighted. So Zips already starts with kind of a distribu distribution of how strong a, a team is. It, it it looks at a team that, that say the Rays, Zips has had them around as a 90-win team in a, in a perfect league where they just play everybody, you know, a million times. Zips knows that it, they might actually be a 93-win team. They might actually be an 87-win team, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I uh, use a Monte Carlo simulation to, to do the actual season standings. Uh, that way I can kind of, you know, build in some of that uncertainty just on a simulated level rather than having to actually just figure out and calculate or, you know, brute force variance that way. Uh, so that, that's how Zips does it. I'm not sure, always sure if it's the best way. Uh, I know some people will actually use the game sims themselves, but I, I, I try not to rely on things that I don't do, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, Dan, you had a full season uh, projections before COVID hit, uh, and then you had to obviously rerun the numbers uh, <laughs> once we knew we had a 60-game season. Uh, how dramatic were your kind of playoff and World Series odds when you made that change and for teams like the, you know, the, the favorites like the Dodgers and the Yankees? Yeah, it, it, it had a pretty huge change on, on the favorites. Uh, going into uh, the original season, uh, it had the Yankees and Dodgers as over 90% to make the playoffs. Uh, in in uh, 60 games, uh, the Yankees have dropped in the last run. I didn't do another run before tomorrow morning. Uh, but the last run, the Yankees were down to 67%. The Dodgers, 73%. And... You, you see, you know, the basement teams have just a slightly better long shot hope. Uh, right. I mean, it, it had the, the manners up to one in 25 to make the playoffs. <laughs> and psychologically, that just seems weird. But then I had to think, Dan, this is 60 games. Sure. Uh, and, you know, a team starts off, you know, 12 and three or something. And they're probably a playoff team at that point, just by treading water. Because it is the home stretch and we're not used to taking of the season in 60 game terms. 
Uh, so, so it is fascinating. Even the Orioles got a chance to make the playoffs. <laughs> so, so what you're saying, Dan, is you've cleared off your schedule in October to watch some Orioles baseball, right? <laughs> I'm not, not, I'm not going that far. Okay. Uh, I don't even know if they'll. I wonder how the uh, the, the media access in the playoffs is going to work. Right. <laughs> because, okay. because I mean, they normally, you know, with, I mean, you, you, you you're, 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 cred- you're accredited too, uh, if, right? I'm not. No. Oh, I thought you were. Well, either way, the way it works is if you have your uh, BBWA card, you can just kind of show up at the stadium and just, and just yeah. waltz in and go where, do whatever you want. You, you can't do that this year. They've limited to, to 30 people who can go in, hmm. uh, and that includes photographers as well. So you hmm. really have to fight to get in. Uh, I'm actually skipping it this year because I really don't want to take right. uh, spots from, from, from the beat guys. Right, uh, right. Because, I mean, they have to be there in a way that I don't necessarily have to be there. Right. I mean, a lot of the guys in the press box, they're, you know, they're working, working. And me, I'm wandering out to get a hot dog or like <laughs> opening day last year. I was away from the press box for like three innings because I was trying to find the bourbon slushies. The beat guys don't have that luxury. So, so yeah. I, I try to, you know, it, it's going to be weird not being at a baseball game. But I'm wondering about the playoffs. Because yeah. I do, if the Orioles make the playoffs, I really do have to get to one of those games. It would be tempting, especially given the expectations heading into this year. You know, you know, why not take a take a trip out there, especially for such a beautiful park. You know, uh, taking a game there, and if there's no one else, uh, that doesn't hurt things too much either. Let's talk about the the schedule because that's another big thing that's changed here because it's a very division heavy schedule and. Some divisions are not as strong as others if we're going to, you know, play things, uh, play things nicely here. But when we look at the teams in the new schedules, were there any teams that benefited more than others from this change where it's so specific and so central to their division? I had the changes as basically division benefits. Uh, certain teams have to play certain rivals more than others. It wasn't quite as balanced as it looked. But the big thing is the divisional issues because I do have the Eastern and Western divisions as significantly stronger than the Central. And while that's not really as big of a big of an big enough big of an effect on divisional races, when you talk wild cards, it's it's extremely significant because everybody's still competing against each other in the standings, except they don't actually play each other, which is kind of an odd thing i almost feel like they should have done it in three different leagues somehow and then kind of like yeah. a round robin championship or something they, they didn't get that creative in the end they and given how hard it was just to get the season going and how they didn't start talking about this until the end of may which is absolutely right. absurd that they <laughs> oh maybe we should start thinking about the whole money thing <laughs> uh, so so we didn't get anything cool like that uh but it does give a, a significant benefit to the central teams, uh, especially kind of those mid-tier contenders that already have gotten some help uh, from the schedule. Uh, I think the White Sox are a, are a team that really benefited a lot. Uh, they, they do have a fairly deep rotation now, uh, especially compared to last year, and they have an easier schedule, and that, that's, that, that's beneficial. They may not win the division, but they get kind of, you know, a leg up over, say, a team like the Angels or Rangers or other second tier teams because they're playing, you know, the Royals and Tigers a lot and they're not playing the Astros or A's. Uh, right. So it's, it's, it's helpful for the central teams generally. It's unhelpful for the, the coasts. Excellent. So, Dan, you post, uh, I mean, not only do you post win totals, uh, which, which you did on Fangraphs this year, and I believe before it was on ESPN. Yeah, uh, Fangraphs and ESPN since 2010. Uh, we used to do them in the magazine every year, which was fun. Uh, they don't print the magazine anymore. It's just online only. And then before that, uh, Baseball Think Factory, Baseball Primer. Excellent. Um, when you look over at FanDuel Sportsbook, is there anything in terms of win totals or World Series odds that you find interesting? Uh, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I look at the odds, I kind of like, from, from a from a championship standpoint, I don't usually bet a lot on champions. I usually don't find, like, a ton of, of play in there, so that isn't usually my favorite bet. But I do like some of the, the odds for teams to make the playoffs that are not good teams, but they're not Tigers, <laughs> Orioles bad. Uh, I, I, I like the Marlins. They have an interesting oh. rotation. They have 
slap together a lineup who which has to be better than last year. And I, I, I think that they that they do have, if you look at the odds, that it, it is tempting. I look at the Royals in the same way. They're not a good team, but they have enough major league players that I think they could make a run and make the playoffs. Uh, so those are two teams in particular I like. Uh, that's I know it feels weird bidding on the Royals after I've badmouthed them for so long. <laughs> uh, it's like, hey, wait, what, what do you mean you're making money off us, Dan? But I, I do think those are good value bets. Have you gotten more flack from Royals fans on Twitter or Rockies fans? Like, which which one is more abusive to you? It used to be Royals fans. Now it's Rockies fans. <laughs> they don't know why I'm picking on them because normally nobody cares about the Rockies. <laughs> but the Rockies just drive me nuts sometimes. Yeah, it's the little things. It's it's the owners declaring how they extrapolated that they or they interpolated, and they have 94 wins this year because <laughs> of like they compared it to like 2009, 2010, like. That doesn't. It's not how the word works, or how the math works, or how logic works. Well, even like as a fantasy player, like the Rockies drive me nuts because like I want to like guys like Ryan McMahon and Garrett Hampson, but then they'll inevitably sign some veteran who has been dust for fifteen years and just frustrate me to no end. So like I, as a fantasy player, enjoy it when you bash the Rockies. So it's kind of like <laughs> cathartic for me to read your tweets sometimes. And and. and... And there's things like, you know, Jeff Breidich talking, give, quitting, giving a quotes about how, you know, writers don't anything about leadership. And he compared himself to a brain surgeon. Uh, <laughs> you might have seen that one. It was it was a fun one. And just some of the things they do just kind of bother me in an annoying way. Yeah. Uh, the way they showed no interest in Mike Talkman. I didn't think Mike Talkman was going to be as, as good as he was with the Yankees, obviously. But the team showed no interest in even looking at that. They gave Matt Holliday, you know time at the end of his career they bring carlos gonzalez back no matter how he played they did that <laughs> for a number of years but they didn't even look at mike talkman they didn't even look at roberto ramos last year i didn't think he was gonna be a star or even an average player but it's like they didn't care to find this out and now you look at their second base situation you, you, you mentioned ryan mcmahon you have mcmahon and hampson you have brendan rogers in there and they seem mostly concerned with how, how do we find playing time for chris owings right so we gotta look at this matt kemp kid <laughs> it's it, it's it's a frustrating team. They don't really do any like awful trades we can make fun of, like you know right. the, the the Swanson trade. Uh, but they just do these things that just nag on me for some reason. Right. <laughs> well, if you do want to follow Dan and bet the the Royals and the Marlins, Royals plus uh, twenty five hundred to make the playoffs at FanDuel Sportsbook, and the Marlins plus eighteen hundred. So really intriguing odds there. But Dan, as you mentioned, like I guess. A lot of zips, at least the way that most of us use it, is player level. And we can bet on individual player awards. And there are actually a lot of season-long statistical categories we can bet on, like who are the most home runs, stuff like that. Any players stand out to you as being undervalued with the 60-game schedule based on the odds at FanDuel Sportsbook? I, what, I, what I really like, actually, on the prop bets is some of the awards. Uh, I, I've, I, I've done well with awards. Uh, one of my favorite bets of all time... Uh, and thankfully, I, I recorded it in my preseason betting piece for ESPN. Uh, was, was when I predicted Max Scherzer's breakout season, yeah. and, and I got I got him uh, to uh, uh, win the Cy Young at, at plus two thousand. Uh, and I and I thought that was a good value bet. And you know, you make enough good value bets, you'll they'll work out over time. So I, I tend to like some of these second tier Cy Youngs. I, I I think Cole is it's probably a little too much because, I mean, you're, it's. The, the implied odds, last I checked, were almost like more, more than one in three, and I don't think it's that good for, for him to win this eye. But I, I, I do like like Lance Lynn. Last I checked, I mean, if you think he has a 4 or 5% chance to win this eye, that's a good value bet at, at that point. Uh, the, the same uh, with Otani. I think the Angels are going to push a healthy Otani. Uh, and that gives and he has such a story behind him. That's the kind of guy who can impress voters. I mean, it's more that based than it used to be. I don't think we are going to be voting. I don't think if we had a repeat of 1995 that Dante Bichette would would be second in the MVP voting. Uh, I hope not. I certainly wouldn't have made that <laughs> vote. Uh, my my one sad thing is I can't bet on National League awards anymore since I'm a voter. I had a oh, I had a moment no. of panic. That, that that after Christian Yelich's breakout, because after I, I spent that offseason writing pieces about how I thought he was like a big breakout guy, uh, he headlined two ESPN pieces for me, uh, and then I bet on him to win the MVP. Yeah. 
And I was thinking, wait, what if I had to vote on this? I'm going to have to and I have to actually abstain because I can't, you know, ethically vote on an award right. in which it pays <laughs> me off. Even if I didn't get caught, I that's 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 pretty, you know, skeezy. Right. <laughs> so I can't, I can't vote on the NL awards anymore. And that makes me kind of sad. Yeah. Uh that is sad. But hey, at least you got the the yellowish ticket in there. That's always helpful. Uh Lance Lynn is 30 to 1 as is Otani and Lynn last year was pretty, like, again, I keep bringing it back to fantasy, but, like, that's where my main focus is. Lance Lynn in DFS last year was really, really fun. So I'm hoping we get some, some more of that this year, and hopefully we can get Dan, uh, help him out there uh, with Lance Lynn being 30-1. to 1. Dan Zimborski of Fangrass, thank you for swinging by and talking some baseball here today. Really appreciate all the thoughts and all the conversation. I want to let you go so you can go enjoy the baseball tomorrow night and hopefully well beyond that, and maybe we'll talk to you again here soon. Thanks for having me on, guys. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Dan Zimborski for swinging by and breaking down this 60-game MLB season. Make sure you follow Dan on Twitter at DZimborski, S-Z-Y-M-B-O-R-S-K-I, and check out his work over at Fangrass.com. And, Ed, uh, I didn't expect the Royals and the Marlins to come up in that conversation, but I totally <laughs> get it, and I think that his analysis on those, those two specific teams is pretty spot on, too. Yeah, absolutely. In a 16 game se- 60 game season, you're going to see much more variance in terms of uh, the results, and you're going to have some of those long shots. Uh, I I put together a um, little computer ensemble model, so I took five models uh, that I think are pretty good at projecting win totals, put them together, and you know Miami's 25th and Kansas City's 26th, which is exactly kind of in that uh, not very good, but not the Tigers or the Orioles either. Right. And so, uh, the, yeah. there's uh, another writer at Fangrask named Paul Sporer. He calls that, he's referring to like starting pitching ranks, but what he calls it is the blob. And the blob is like this area where the difference between the first, the top, you know, we'll call it teams here, the top team in the blob and the bottom team in the blob, the gap is not all that big. Yeah. And I think that the benefit of the 60-game season is it increases the blob. It makes more teams relevant. And Miami and Kansas City are at least on the bottom end of that ma- massive blob, which means if they happen to, you know, have a good stretch, like Dan said, yep. you could very well see a team like that make the playoffs. Yeah, and you have some health and yeah. a lack of COVID-positive tests, yeah. uh, which is, you know, all of a sudden an issue. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I mean, I often think of it, I don't really call it the blob, but right. I call it the fat middle. You know, you think about it and and this is, you know, in the NFL, you have such a short season that I'm not actually convinced that how much we can say about the fat blob in the middle. Like, I know we know what the top five and the bottom five teams are, but I mean, how much can we really say in 16 games about those middle teams? Um, I've been meaning to like run a model where, you know, you look at the model and you obviously make the, 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 the standard prediction when you have a good team or a bad team versus anyone else, but like just predicting like, you know, a three point win for the home team for any two teams in the middle of the blob and seeing how that does. Right. I actually, I, should, I, I need to, I need to get on that. It'd be an interesting thing. See, to we're do. just, we're spurring up content ideas here. This is, this <laughs> is the whole point, but it was also nice to talk to Dan because like, it's another really smart math guy like you, who you can kind of talk to, you know, ask some good questions. And I think that it's always beneficial to hear from smart people like that. If we're trying to make ourselves smarter too. Yeah, absolutely. He talked about principal component analysis. Uh, this is a linear algebra technique where you, you basically look at a matrix of variables and you figure out which ones are the most important and which ones are the most predictive. I've heard about this being done for basketball. Uh, he's clearly doing it for baseball. Um, and I actually have a neighbor that does, uh, he does cognitive science research. So he takes brain scans and tries to predict things based on that. And, uh, you know, this is a pretty big research group at the University of Michigan. And, and he applied a number of techniques to try to p- predict certain attributes based on these brain scans. And, and this includes like, you know, all your typical machine learning things that go into your self-driving cars and, and all these things. And he actually found out the best predictor was PCA, this principal component analysis. So it kind of makes me think that I should start messing with that myself um, in, in doing some of this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, math is powerful, right? I mean, this is why, this is why you should pay attention. We should have had Dan on earlier, so we could have gotten you on this uh, PCA kick during the pandemic. I, I know. Still I mean, pandemic, but. Yeah, there's there's so many things going on, but 
Yeah, no, I think I think it, yeah, it should. It's something that should be done in, in NFL and college. I'm sure someone someone out there has done it. But. I'm also so curious what what a cookout in your neighborhood is like because you have that professor. Didn't you live by John Beeline at one point too? I still live nearby. Yeah. Yeah. He so like, group. what are the cookouts like in this town? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. The cookouts are fun. Uh, that's why. That's why I moved here. I'm jealous. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's there's mostly doctors and you know, yeah, John Beeline and Jim Harbaugh in my neighborhood. Oh, Not my that God. I see the latter two at cookouts, but right, uh, right. But yeah, John it's a good time. He'll bring the milk. Uh, we know that for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, let's move into covering the future. And Ed, one thing you had mentioned while we were talking about Dan was you have this ensemble computer win totals for baseball and yeah. trying to take predictions you think are smart and kind of combine them together. What takeaways have you gotten from looking at those numbers this year? Yeah. Yeah. Jim, I'm happy to talk through any teams, but I mean, the idea is pretty simple, you know, take five models. Uh, so you take zips, which we've talked about our, uh, a bunch already. Uh, 538, which is an ELO model. Uh, Clay Davenport, who is another guy that, that has been doing projections for a long time, uh, Pocota, Baseball Prospectus, and Fangraphs. Uh, so the standings, projections at Fangraphs. Uh, you combine them together. One of these years, I'm actually going to go back and look at historical accuracy so sure. that I can kind of reweight things and, and weight uh, models that I like better more. But right now, they're just all equal. Um, so in terms of win totals, you know, the ensemble is highest on the Dodgers at 37.1 wins. The Yankees are next at 35.9. Houston's next at 35.6 and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Houston's a really interesting team um, in that, you know, they were very good last year. Obviously made it all the way to the World Series before the, the epic uh, away team wins all <laughs> situation that we that we had last year. Um, they're obviously an interesting team in terms of the cheating scandal that is, has since come out. Um, but another thing I do over my site is calculate cluster luck. And here the idea is that um, based on the underlying statistics, how many runs should you have scored? So based on how many homers, singles, doubles, triples, walks, so on and so forth, how many runs should you have scored? And the idea is that some teams are going to cluster a lot of runs together. Uh you know, if you get nine singles in one inning, you're going to score a lot more runs if, than if you scatter those nine singles over nine innings, one single uh, each inning. And so cluster luck is a way of kind of figuring out how lucky a team was in terms of clustering their hits. And, and we know that um, uh, we know when you do this analysis that, uh, you know, you're, it, it's luck, right? Like being lucky in, in one season doesn't project to the next season. Uh, Houston was actually almost negative 38 runs in cluster luck last year. Negative? I mean, that's an astronomical total. I think they were like dead last for a while. Um, Detroit was actually last at, at minus 68 uh, cluster uh, r negative runs. So they should have scored 68 more runs than, yeah. than they actually did. So they were bad, but probably not as awful as they were in the standings. So anyways, um, you know, Edward Egosh actually tweeted out my cluster luck stuff today, maybe, uh, which got me to look at my own stuff, which <laughs> <laughs> shows you how smart I've been this week. But, but anyways, um, he did point out that, you know, Houston was actually very unlucky despite all their success last year. And that could potentially project to, uh, good things for them this year, despite losing Garrett Cole. Uh, let me say one last thing about the the computer ensemble uh, numbers that I have. They have Detroit at 24.5 wins, and this was a very interesting team because every single projection w said over the win total at FanDuel at 21. And, I think it's 21 and a half. At least it was yeah. earlier this week. So um, I would not simply take my numbers and go make a bet. But if there's something you like about the Detroit Tigers team, uh, you think they they can do something as in not completely sucking over 60 games, uh, a lot of these models support that thinking. It, it's 21 and a half still, and it's actually minus 102 on the over. So you're actually getting, like, you're not laying that much juice either because it's minus 120 yeah. on the under. So they're baiting you towards the under, and it sounds like they're over by three wins uh, based on the projection systems. Yeah. I mean, oh. uh, I mean I'm looking at it right now. Zips is the lowest with Detroit at 23. Uh, Fangrass and Davenport at 25, 538 at 24. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So, uh, maybe so, you, you want... know, like I actually added the last, I added zips in, in 538 before the show today. Um, yeah. 
before that, the other three models actually really liked Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> but then Zips in 538 pulled it right back down. It's really funny that Dan, who is an Orioles fan, it was his projection system that dragged the Orioles down. <laughs> exactly. And you know how he busted all on Colorado yeah. uh, during the show. Like, Zips was by far the lowest win total <laughs> on Colorado of any of the five. I mean, the Orioles are starting Tommy Malone as their opening day guy. I think that tells you all you need to know there. Um, Tommy Malone, okay starter. Probably not a dude you want as your opening day starter. But I think uh, that's really interesting, especially with the Tigers. You know, we're talking about the Tigers, the Royals, the Marlins. There is nothing more chaotic than upping up, uh, upping those three teams. So we are embracing the randomness here as we get set for the 2020 MLB season. My covering the future is focusing on another sport in action on Thursday night, and that is NASCAR, because we've got a NASCAR race coming up on Thursday as opposed to Sunday for this week. It's in Kansas, and once again, shocker, my model is highest than Ryan Blaney. He is first there, makes sense. He has a top five average running position in all three tracks similar to Kansas this year, so you had a nine to one. I like Blaney there. However, if you listen to this podcast regularly, you probably just knew to bet Blaney by now because like, that's just kind of like the every week thing. So I'm not going to bore you. This is not a Ryan Blaney segment. I promise. Instead, we're talking about his teammate. That's Joey Logano. Logano is 16 to 1, which I'm pretty sure is the longest value he has been all year long. And on one hand, kind of makes sense. In the six races at one and a half mile tracks since his win in Las Vegas, he has just one top five finish. But that win in Vegas is big because it is a track that is similar to Kansas. It is one and a half miles with moderate banking. The other two races like that have been in Homestead and in Kentucky. In Homestead, Logano led 27 laps, but he got in a wreck on pit road, which hurt his car, finished 27th there, not a good day. Then in Kentucky, Logano had a sixth place average running position, which is really not that bad. He's coming off a third place run last week, another mile and a half track, uh, though with different banking. So, He's been better than his results would indicate, and he has been best at the tracks most similar to Kansas. Logano has not won in Kansas since 2015, but he is a two-time winner here. He also had a fourth-place average running position in both 2018 races at this track. So if we're looking at my model overall, yes, Blaney is first, of course, because it's it's my model. It's just kind of how things go. But Logano is sixth, and everybody who is higher than him in my model is plus 850 or shorter to win, whereas Logano is 16 to 1. That is easily long enough for me to jump back in on Logano uh, to win Thursday night's race. I've been kind of off Logano for the past month and a half or so. Haven't recommended him too much in that time. But I think now with the odds, I think overreacting as much as I have, I'm going to buy back into Joey Logano 16 to one to win Thursday's race. But if it happens to be Ryan Blaney, I'm going to go ahead and claim victory anyway, because we've been talking so much about him regardless <laughs> uh, ever since things picked back up here on covering the spread. And I'm sad though, that NASCAR's time in the spotlight it's coming to an end. Like, I'm still going to watch it, but, like, it's just sad. They're, like, they're, they're losing their spotlight here. Well, that was inevitably going to happen with some of these sports coming back. Um, you know, baseball took a long time to come back, but at least it's it's back, and then the NBA starts next week, so. Yeah. We're going to talk some, M- for some NBA next week, too, so that'll be a lot yep. of fun. Um, it's going to be weird having all these sports going. Like, I know – my work schedule will be chaotic because I've been doing NASCAR PGA stuff, a little bit of MMA, but then you add baseball, which is every day. And we're doing two shows per day around baseball. Like things are about to get really crazy and it's not going to end until the NFL season stops, whenever that may be. So we're going to, we're going to be busy here for the next couple of months. So you're doing daily shot, which is your just solo episode talking DFS for. Yep. And then uh, in the afternoon, I'll be doing a Twitch stream. I don't think they've announced this yet. I don't know. Whatever. Who cares? I don't care personally. (laughs) Um, We can break it here. If if Cap gets on your case. Yeah, exactly. I'll send him him your way because I don't want to deal with it. (laughs) Uh, But it is uh, every day at 4 p.m. We'll be on Twitch. I'll be going through lineups, uh, talking about takeaways from those, talking some weather because weather is huge for MLB DFS. Uh, That's on the – I think it's, like, brand new, the FanDuel Twitch stream. I honestly don't know, but we're doing the stuff with it for the first time in a while. So it'll be interesting. I am not a uh, a youth anymore. I don't think I can call myself that. Uh, so I'm not super familiar with Twitch. So it, it could be rocky to start, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. Has Twitch gone beyond gaming? 
Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, and Jonathan Bale's doing push-ups. <laughs> I forgot that was on Twitch. I watched a lot of that stream. I'm I watched embarrassed a lot of that stream, too. I'm embarrassed at how much I watched that. I forgot well, that that happened. That's... No, Tim, that was in the middle of, like, March or April. Like, yeah. when we had no NCAA tournament, there was nothing going on. <laughs> Literally, the world had stopped. Like, I, we are, we're both getting a pass for watching, like, hours of Jonathan Bale's doing push-ups. Like, like when, that when... was the thing that week. In future generations, when they ask us what we did during the pandemic, am I going to talk about I watched, I watched some guy do push-ups for yeah. a thing I didn't even bet on? Like, is that going to be the thing that I discuss? That's going to be your legacy, I guess. There we go. That's, uh, that's a wild, wild thing. But hey, baseball's back. We still got NASCAR. NBA's back. I can finally watch real sports again, and I am so pumped for that. That is all that we have for today's show here on Covering the Spread. Once again, a big thank you to Dan Zimborski for swinging by and breaking down this year's MLB win totals and player awards, To Follow Dan on Twitter, at DZimborski. And again, uh, check out his work over at Fangraphs.com, some stuff over at ESPN as well. And check out the Zips projections, which can be found over on Fangraphs. Ed, what's going on for you over on the Power Rank this week? Yeah, so, um, well, nothing much this week. Uh, well, I mean, so so come by. Sign up for my new- newsletter. Same pitch every week. Um, but I will post those win totals uh, on the blog so you can take a look at them. Uh, uh, so hopefully they will be up by the time this, this pod goes up. And then um, I'm actually working on some pretty big studies, a pretty big study of NFL quarterbacks. Okay. And uh, I'm going to tease a little bit about what you might expect next week, except that it's going to be uh, something about the NBA okay, and three-point shooting. So um, that's coming out early next week. I, I'm very excited about this. Um, definitely one of the better things I've ever done. So, uh, yeah, so that'll be up next week. We'll talk about it more then. But if you want to get you know the first glimpse at it, uh, sign up for my email newsletter over at thepowerrank.com. I'm excited to see how you can link three-point shooting with NFL quarterbacks. That's going to be fun. This is going to be a a fun ride. So make sure you tune in next week as well to hear Ed on that and go to thepowerrack.com to check out uh, his MLB win totals uh, based on the uh, composite models. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. As mentioned, we have uh, the solo shot, which is going up every day starting tomorrow for the two-game slate. We'll still have one there, a little bit shorter, uh, obviously, but that will be up there. Twitch stream later in the day. So subscribe to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed to get that, our NASCAR podcast, our PGA podcast, probably some UFC podcasts occasionally, NBA podcasts next week with Tom Vecchio. So a lot of stuff going over on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. We're probably not going anywhere with covering the spread for a while. We got our one-off week, so we'll be here every week. Make sure you're subscribed to us as well by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear from us or Dan or anybody else, please leave us a rating and review as well. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, oh so much as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. You made it. We finally reached the beginning of the Big Four, resuming play once again with baseball tomorrow. Sit back, enjoy, and hopefully win some money in the process. We'll talk to you all again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. (laughs) 